Hi, my name is Hassan Raza. I'm one of the members of the Critical Care Ultrasound team at Western University, and I wanted to introduce a case of normotensive cardiogenic shock. Special thanks to Rob Arnfield. So to start off, I think you guys should watch this stroke volume determination video if you haven't already, as it's really important to know this material before watching this video. An 80-year-old woman presents with worsening confusion and diffuse nonspecific pain. She has a known history of heart failure with reduced EF of only 35%. She has a mitral clip in place as well. She is admitted to medicine for sepsis secondary to a UTI. She's been having a rising lactate and rising creatinine despite getting multiple rounds of IV fluids by the primary team. Her blood pressure is 130 over 80, heart rate 65, and she's setting 95% on room air. Despite the fact that she has normal vital signs, she's been having this worsening end organ perfusion parameters, so we decided to undergo a point of care, critical care echo to see what exactly is going on at the level of the heart. So we start off with a parasternal long axis view. Uh, right off the bat, we can see that she has at least moderately reduced LV systolic function. She has a dilated left atrium. She has a mitral clip in place, and you can see that there's posterior acoustic shadowing underneath it. And uh, one important thing to know is that something we use to evaluate LV systolic function, the EPSS, cannot actually be used in this case because of the mitral clip. Next, we put some color on the mitral valve and we see severe MR. We then put color on the tricuspid valve in an RV inflow track view and we see severe TR. Now we're in a parasternal short axis view and again we see moderately reduced LV systolic function. We see a dilated, thickened RV with septal flattening. Now we're in an apical four chamber view. Again, we see moderately reduced LV systolic function. We see a dilated right ventricle with reduced tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. We see a dilated right atrium as well. We measure our LVOT diameter. Now this is where the money is. So we check an LVOT VTI by putting a pulse wave Doppler over here in the LVOT. Right off the bat, we can see our VTI is quite small, and when you actually measure it, we see that the VTI is only 12.5 centimeters. We do a little quality assurance to make sure that it's accurate. We look at our angle, it looks like it's pretty good, less than 20 degrees, and we see that our spectral window here is dark in the center, ensuring that we have a good, accurate waveform. This is an IVC view. We see that it's plethoric with minimal respiratory variation. Again, we see our IVC and we have our hepatic veins as well that's draining into it. We see that it's plethoric again, indicating right-sided congestion. Now you can't have a proper hemodynamics evaluation without looking at the lungs, right? So we start with the right side. Right off the bat, we see that the patient has lung sliding and has a pretty good A profile bilaterally with curtain sign at the basis. Now let's look at the left side. Again, we see lung sliding, we see an A profile, and at the basis, we note that there's some subdiaphragmatic anechoic area over here, which is consistent with ascites in this case. Again, pointing towards right-sided congestion. So, now that we have all these pictures and the clinical scenario, what should be the next step in management? Should we A, give fluids? Should we start norepinephrine? Should we start dobutamine? Should we start furosemide infusion? Or should we just trend that lactate for now? You know, maybe Q6, because the blood pressure is normal, right? So it's likely just a type B lactic acidosis, and we don't really have to do anything for that, right? That would be totally wrong. The next step should be we should start dobutamine, and we should start a furosemide infusion, and I'll tell you why. So in what shock category does our patient lie in exactly? Right off the bat, you might be like, whoa, lots of equations and diagrams, but it actually is pretty straightforward. We can calculate our stroke volume and our cardiac output based off the information we have. 
So we already got our LVOT diameter by measuring it. It was 1.9 centimeters. Using this number, we can plug that into this equation to calculate our cross-sectional area of the LVOT at 2.83. We multiply that by our VTI to calculate our stroke volume, which ends up being only 35 cc's. Now keep in mind, a normal stroke volume is going to be over 60 cc, so we're around half of a normal stroke volume, which is bad. But what's our cardiac output? So we have a heart rate of 65. We multiply our stroke volume by the heart rate, and we get a cardiac output of only 2.3 liters per minute, which is dangerously low. So this puts us into a cardiogenic shock category, given the low cardiac output and her clinical presentation of volume overload and right-sided congestion. Now we start the dobutamine infusion and the furosemide infusion, and we do another echo. This is probably one of the best things about advanced critical care echo is that you can repeatedly perform measurements and 2D evaluations at the bedside rapidly. So right off the bat, we can see that the heart rate is faster now, and we can also see that maybe the LV and the RV seems to be squeezing a little bit better than it was before. And now we, again, go back to where the money is, right? We do an LVOT VTI, and right off the bat, you can see that the VTI waveforms look much taller than they did before. And when we end up measuring it, we see that the VTI is better at 16.3 centimeters, and the stroke volume is increased to 50 cc's. Now, maybe you're thinking that a 15 cc increase in the stroke volume is not that big of a deal, is it? But actually, when you multiply it by now her increased heart rate of 84 beats per minute, we get a cardiac output of 4.2 liters per minute, which is much better for her clinically. So we noted clinical improvement after starting the inotropes and the diuretics. Her lactate went from 8 all the way down to 1 within a matter of several hours. Her urine output improved as well. She was in less pain. She was less confused. She began to interact with the family more. And eventually she was weaned off of inotropes and she was initiated on oral after low reduction agents. So I wanted to talk a little bit about normotensive cardiogenic shock. So the shock trial, which was actually in the early 2000s, uh, which evaluated early revascularization with PCI for patients in cardiogenic shock, about 5% of them actually had a systolic blood pressure of over 90, uh, despite being in cardiogenic shock. So that's why they coined the term normotensive cardiogenic shock. Um, those patients were found to have uh, in-hospital mortality of 43% in that registry. So it's really important to know about this, and you're really not going to know that this is going on unless you have some form of quantitative determination of the stroke volume for diagnosis. And how exactly are you going to get that these days? At least non-invasively, the best way to get that information is going to be by advanced critical care echo right at the bedside. So just because you don't have hypotension doesn't mean that you don't have shock. And this is really important because hypotension or the cardiovascular assessment of the patient is not the only factor that determines whether or not a patient has shock. We look at multiple organ systems to see if they're in multi-organ failure. And if you have inadequate delivery of oxygen or inadequate uptake of oxygen by the tissues, you will be in shock. Here's a paper in the Circulation Journal on Contemporary Management of Cardiogenic Shock. And in this paper, they do describe the phenotype of normotensive shock, of which they recommend starting inotropes for. So some important take-home points from this case. Advanced critical care echo, or ACE, can help accurately categorize shock status and hemodynamics. As you saw in this case, without doing the critical care echo, we wouldn't have known that the patient was in normal tensive shock or what the etiology was or how to manage it or even evaluate the response to the treatment. So that's how important it was in this case. Normotensive cardiogenic shock is very interesting, but keep in mind that it's much less common than hypotensive cardiogenic shock or your classic cardiogenic shock. Right-sided heart failure will present with dry lungs and peripheral overload. As you saw in this patient, she had dry lungs and she was peripherally very overloaded. What I think was going on was that the right side was not able to push enough blood forward to the left side of the heart, and because of that, the left side, in turn, was not able to push anything forward, causing this spiral of death. 
And the last thing is that the LVOT VTI can be remeasured to directly assess the response to therapy. Thank you very much and happy scanning.